Pardon me? Does it usually say it's being recorded? It says recording, yeah, it's like right, recording. right now. So I think that we're good. It's a little hard to oh, talk because there's nobody else on the other end, so we can't really <laughs> test if our sound is coming through, but I'm going to hope that it is. No. <clears throat> Maybe we'll give just another two minutes in case people are running a little late. I know it's been a hectic morning. How often do they need under the tree? As needed, or uh, it's yeah, mostly as needed. So um, they have. Um, so it's an informal governmental structure. It is relatively informal. Um, it's formal though in the sense that it's recognized by the oh, it So okay. yeah, so it's legitimate um, and has a sort of legislative basis, but it's informal in the way that it operates. So that's part of the difficulty of how do you reconcile the tension between formality and informality because the informality is, is part of its design, right? Like that's part of what you're recognizing even when you are legislating um, recognition of these institutions. But, um, and, and that's, you know, what people value about it. That's part of what works. Um, but then on the other hand, um, you know, when you're coming at it from especially a constitutional perspective and a human rights perspective, um, you want to build in safeguards, and um, and often, you know, there is like the tension around informality and flexibility that then it makes it much more subject to, you know, personality than you would sort of ideally want, um, you know, an institutional framework and structure and and process to be. So, yeah. Is there a documentation process? Uh, there used to be. So um, under the Abafte legislation. So this is probably what we're going to do next. So. Well, actually, not 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 in that much detail. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, under the Abafte legislation, um, there was like there was a sort of quadruplicate um, uh, like pad that they had to fill out, and one copy went to the plaintiff, one copy went to the defendant or respondent, and then um, uh, one copy stayed with the the traditional. Um, court, the traditional forum, and then one copy went to the magistrate's court. Um, and so um, when a bunch of the apostate legislation was repealed, that whole like documentation process went with it, the repeals. And so now the process is just informal and there's no record. And so one of the tricks, one of the questions really, the challenges is um, if you are creating a system by which people can appeal from these indigenous forums to the state forums, the magistrate's court and above, um, how do you have an appeal when there's no record and there's no actual link between these two institutions and the processes? And so, um, you know, it, it ends up being that when people are appealing to the state system, it's actually a, an original case. It's being heard as though it's a new case. So, um, uh, in that sense, then, you know, it raises questions about how how much are these indigenous forms really included in the justice system at large. So. But there was a law, I think, uh, from the 1920s, and then is that what you're talking about? Was When was it repealed? Uh, so that law actually is what recognizes these institutions, and that hasn't been repealed. Oh, it has not. Um, so parts of it have been repealed because it dealt with several different things that are no longer, you know, acceptable under a democratic arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, just basically kind of, it was, a, it was a, a fundamentally segregationist tool. But then the pieces that have been retained are the pieces that regulate these forms and recognize their existence. Um, but then um, there were subsequent pieces of law that were passed that kind of like, sort of like regulations that filled in the details. Um, of how you know these forms would work in conjunction with the state forms, and that's what was repealed. And that um, it was only, I mean, interestingly, it, it had only been parsed, passed in about the 1960s, um, and then was repealed in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so so um, certainly in the last 20, 25 years, um, you've actually had like somewhat of a vacuum in terms of the, mm -hmm. the legal arrangement. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure everybody here knows each other. Bill, have you met everybody in the room? No. You have not? Okay, let's go around and just say who we are and uh, 
what work we do here real briefly before Cindy so gets started. Yeah, and let me know if that is going to work. Yeah, no, I'm sure it will. I'm just going to minimize this for a sec yeah, just so that I can good. go to full screen. That's totally fine. So I'm Anya Weber from the Marketing and Communications team. I'm Karthik Trivedi. I'm from the research team. Uh, Karen Zimbrick from the research team. And Jillian McDonald, faculty. May Laurie Warren, also from the research team. Bill Karen with the school. Lydia Landon, I'm a um, PhD student and graduate research assistant. And I'm Cindy mm -hmm. Dimitri. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming and um, yeah, hearing me talk about this project, which is uh, I've been working on it for wow, like five and a half years now. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe longer actually, because I started. Um, the first round of sort of preliminary data collection was um, in late 2009, October 2009. Um, and so, yeah, um, and uh, some of you would have seen the document that um, Anya circulated and um, basically the sort of context of it all was that um, the South African government is trying to repeal the 1927 legislation <coughs> and put in place a much more rigorous um, uh, regulatory framework for these um, traditional institutions. Um, and so um, part of it has to do with the fact that um, our constitution recognizes indigenous law um, and, and it actually recognizes um, the fact that um, you know, communities live according to their indigenous principles and values and um, as part of the right to culture. And actually the constitution has two um, provisions on the right to culture. One is an individual right to culture. So, you know, you as an individual can practice culture however you please. Um, and um, a second one, which actually is a group right to culture, but even that is framed in terms of individual rights. So it's um, individuals basically have the right to club together to form and practice and sustain a culture. Um, and um, and so, of course, like, you know, the Constitution provides a framework for people to have access to forums that are going to hear their cases. Um, specifically, it provides for regulation of courts. But then one of the question is, um, one of the questions on the table is, can you call these courts, right? So the image in the bottom right-hand corner is the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Um, and then the image um, on the top left um, is the justice under a tree, which happens on... Um, you know, in rural areas around the country. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, the Constitutional Court's um, mo motto and their, and their um, logo is justice under a tree. And you can see the sort of play on race in terms of like, you know, black and white, everybody has justice under the same tree. Um, and so that's one of the questions is, can you really say that the justice under a tree that you get under the Constitutional Court mandate um, is the same as the justice under a tree that you actually get in rural areas, you know, in different parts of the country in these um, informal um, uh, dispute resolution forums. Um, and, um, and so I wanted to provide a little bit of context for where I collected my data. So I, um, uh, the image on the left is um, that of South Africa, and um, Guazulu Natal is one of our nine provinces um, on the sort of east coast of South Africa. As you can see, a lot of South Africa is coastal. Um, and um, uh, uh, Msinga is the star. Um, and it's in a sort of mid, it's sort of in the middle of the country, um, sorry, middle of the state of Guazulu Natal. Um, but it's actually like really, really arid land. So um, how people ended up there is largely because of um, about state forced removals and um, and so um, people who had initially kind of inhabited land that was quite productive and um, you know sort of uh, 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 what's it very verdant um, ended up on land that actually is not at all that and so um, how that manifests ultimately is that you know a society that may have been quite agricultural is is no longer able to sustain itself that way, and so very few people actually gain their livelihood from maize, like from growing crops and, and what have you, growing their own food. Um, but they still maintain um, livestock because um, that is their primary sort of um, source of wealth and, and primary asset that is valued within the community and within the culture. Um, but certainly in recent times, um, livestock have just died. Um, uh, at incredible rates because of um, perennial droughts. 
So um, with climate change, um, a place that already was actually not very fertile has become even less fertile, and, um, and so their livestock are not really able to be sustained. But anyway, you get a feel from these images of um, <laughs> how traditional they are, relatively speaking, and um, how they live in very sort of um, dispersed arrangements um, in a, a quite remote part of the, the country. <coughs> um, so wanted to give a little bit of context in terms of um, Singa, like economically speaking. So I've already given a sense of um, just how the community is struggling economically, but um, this gives a sense in terms of, um, so if you look at the bottom left hand image, um, the brown areas of which Msinga is one, um, or part of one, um, have a poverty level um, of uh, 72% or more. So um, in Msinga in particular, unemployment is at about 85%. Um, uh, and I mean, that's effective unemployment. Official unemployment rates are a bit lower, but <laughs> effective unemployment is, is at about 85%. Um, and the largest source of income <coughs> is um, social grants from the government in the form of um, pension grants and um, child support grants. Um, so a very um, poor area. And then the t uh, table at the top left um, shows Msinga as having very little in the form of services. So you see um, nor to 10% um, kind of mostly across the line. So in terms of electricity, water, sanitation, refuse, um, uh, not to 10% provision rate. Um, and then uh, because one of the things I'm interested in is dispute resolution of criminal um, uh, conflict, uh, you <coughs> see on the right-hand side the um, uh, statistics between 2003 and 2010 with respect to crime, um, and actually you see that a lot of the crime in Msinga is um, interpersonal violence. and so. Um, a, an interesting or striking thing to look at is assault with the intent to inflict grievous bodily harm, um, which is actually one of the most frequent instance, instances of, um, of crime. And then you see also burglary at residential premises being really high, and then stock theft, which links back to the idea that stock is a very significant asset in the community that um, people primarily value. Um, and then, and so in a sense, the kinds of crimes show themselves um, the fact that people are quite poor and um, sort of trying to, I guess, um, in a sense, sort of preying on others with respect to um, trying to develop more assets for themselves. Um, but also the fact that actually interpersonal violence um, is actually quite prevalent in the Msinga. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, I'll come to talk to you a little bit more, um, which relates to this particular piece, the illegal possession of firearms and ammunition, is the fact that Mzinga has a lot of um, illegal gun possession, and um, that has like a very long sort of historical basis, um, largely to do with the fact that um, uh, in the early days of um, co colonialism, um, migrant labor patterns were established in, and forced migrant labor, actually, mostly. Um, and the men would go to the mines and would be paid with firearms. And so um, Msinga has a lot of guns. And um, even though the, for the last century, the government has been trying to you know, pick those guns out and try to reduce the, the rights, like, it just has not really been successful. So um, that contributes to the rapid escalation of conflict from just you know, we had an altercation to um, I actually shot and severely wounded or even killed you. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, just to be sure, these are the cases that were filed or reported versus or convicted or? Mm -hmm. So these are the ones that have been um, reported, not necessarily solved. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that is actually an important, an important question. Um, and just to be sure, uh, what do we mean by indigenous in this in our in this That's actually a very good question. So um, uh, uh, South Africa actually does have the like a, an indigenous population that you would typically refer to as like first peoples, right? Um, and those are the Khoisan who 
I think technically are actually the first people in the world. Um, and then um, uh, we have more tribal or traditional groups, and so kind of maybe the second wave of peoples. Um, the Khoisan, much like the Native Americans here in, in the US, um, were primarily obliterated by disease and um, uh, and and war, um, and so they um, they make a very small um, part of the sort of uh, I suppose the cultural landscape around arguing for indigenous rights. Um, and the constitutional court in South Africa has tended not to draw such a stark distinction between um, indigenous in the in the sense of Khoisan and indigenous in the form of um, traditional communities. And in fact, right but right now there's actually legislation on the table um, that will recognize the Khoisan for the first time actually. Um, like properly recognize them as, as legitimate Especially. communities that have their own um, indigenous rights. Um, but that legislation, again, is composed, um, is simultaneously, like it, it regulates simultaneously the tribal or traditional communities as well. So, um, I mean, I think that um, uh, because South Africa, the context is just so different, um, we haven't sort of thought about it or worried about it as much as you hear people kind of concerned about it in other parts of the world. And and um, the local politics hasn't tapped very much into the language of the international indigenous rights movement. Um, so so I think that maybe at, at a point at which it does maybe come to tap into that more, um, you'll see much more of a kind of divergence in terms of making a claim for indigenous rights as okay. being as distinct from tribal or traditional rights. So these courts that we are talking about, these are these are the tribal traditional. Okay, no. Yes. So is there a distinction between rural versus tribal and indigenous? Or? There is. So not all of the rural areas are um, necessarily tribal or traditional. Some of them are actually urban and peri-urban, mm -hmm. but that's a very small okay. part of them. So um, most are actually very um, rural and even deep rural what they refer to as yeah and so what population percentage national population percentage are we talking about in terms of people directly uh, affected about 46 percent yeah yeah That's a um so i mean the statistics wax and wane partly because of the migration yes, patterns sure. but yeah it's about 46 percent of the population that's huge yeah yeah it is really huge i mean i was expecting more of these personally yeah i mean it's interesting i suppose because I mean, South Africa, maybe it's worth reminding that um, South Africa is um, sort of the America of Africa, you know, sense. So predominantly and urban. so there's a lot of urbanization in South Africa, yeah. And increasingly so, because, um, so I could have shown you another map of South Africa, which shows you the economic um, activity um, on the map. And it's basically Cape Town in the southwest, um, uh, East London and Port Elizabeth in sort of the southern corner, um, and then Durban in Guazulu Natal, and then um, uh, Johannesburg, which is sort of in the in the middle of the country almost. Um, and everywhere else is basically like nothing. Um, so when you think about it in terms of just how little economic activity there is outside of these major metropolises, um, you realize why it is that people would be moving. Yeah. And it looks like these reports are from the South African Police Service. They right? are. So this is the so, official national? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So and so that's another thing is these may be underreported. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so um, I mentioned the fact that the South African Constitution does recognize um, these indigenous forums. So um, there's a whole chapter, actually, it's literally like half a page, um, dedicated to um, traditional leadership and to traditional institutions. Um, and the the most important piece is the fact that um, the um, it provides for the fact that national legislation may provide for a role for traditional leadership as an institution at local level on matters affecting local communities. And so um, traditional courts, in a sense, are um, seen through that lens. But as I mentioned also, there is some sort of controversy around the fact that um, on one hand, the Constitution recognizes courts as courts and says, you know, people have the right to have their matters heard in courts um, or an equivalent tribunal. Um, but at the same time, um, you have the problem of 
these particular forms don't look like the state courts. And so, for instance, if courts are fundamentally defined by the fact that they are independent and impartial, well, these are not independent and impartial forms, right? They are very embedded in the social dynamics of that particular community um, and are often strongly driven by personality politics. And so how do you then protect those as courts? And that's something that is yet to be um, resolved or addressed. Um, so I spoke a little bit at the beginning in response to questions about South Africa's history. Um, so um, one of the things that you see with this map, and I'm just going to like take a step back, is that basically these um, areas, these colored areas where indigenous traditional tribal communities live um, are effectively the same areas where they lived under the apartheid government. And this map here is from 1986. And so they are effectively the reservations that um, the apartheid government placed people on. Um, and just to give you a sense of the statistics, um, initially they made up, the reservations made up 6% of the land. Um, and then in the 1950s, the, the government added more land. And so um, they make up 13% of the land. But as I mentioned, the population is about 46% of the population that is there. And that's you know, that's only within the last sort of 20 years, because before then, um, you know, you had more people bound to these areas because the apostate government tried to dissuade um, migration and, uh, sorry, it, it, it tried to dissuade urbanization and compelled women to stay in these rural areas um, and called them f homelands and then said men had to travel to the cities and to the mines and farms to work. And so, I mean, there's a whole other discussion about, um, you know, the the um, the breakdown of the um, traditional family within these communities by virtue of the fact that um, you know, men would go to the towns for two years or, or, or you know, lengthy periods of time and be apart from their families, and so you know would start relationships with new people in the cities and that sort of thing. And so you have all of these families that have been significantly disrupted by the migration patterns that were imposed by the government. Um, but with respect to um, the current um, sort of dynamics, one of the political pieces that's sort of hotly contested is the fact that the um, uh, democratic government has effectively decided to keep these boundaries and kept the institutional framework that was set up by the colonial government as a way of like basically oppressing and um, segregating um, uh, indigenous people into these reservations. <laughs> I know, I show you, I show you your reaction. Um, it's, it's pretty appalling. And that's actually what the Deputy Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court said, right? Um, is It's simply incredible. So there's no talk about land redistribution? So there is talk about land redistribution, um, but only 3% of the land has actually been redistributed to this point. So, um, because because the government's locked itself into um, a willing buyer, willing seller arrangement, and so you know they're not going to expropriate unless the person who they're trying to expropriate from agrees and um, will accept the price. And so that creates, uh, you know, like the government has basically spent most of its money, but is has not been able to actually buy enough land to get people back onto their land that they were just possessed of. Um, in the early days, yeah. So it's a it's a pretty appalling it's a pretty appalling arrangement. Um, but <laughs> looping back, I guess to, to disputes um, within the context of um, you know the apostate arrangements and the sort of segregation and reservations and whatever you um, and and there's a lot of scholarship that talks about how um, in contests for um, government government powers or governance um, powers, um, dispute resolution actually becomes a really significant um, like platform for having those fights. Um, and so you actually saw that between um, uh, uh, the indigenous forums um, trying to you know, resolve local disputes, but um, being so conservative, partly because of the policies that were imposed by the government, but partly because they were trying to also kind of maintain control and their own power. Um, and so then people would um, react negatively to that and maybe go to the state courts. And so one of the things you find often actually in various colonial areas or places is that women and youth 
um, who are the ones who are most likely to be oppressed by the institutions, which are predominantly patriarchal and, and you know, controlled by men, will then go to the state courts to try and get some sort of reprieve. Um, and so that's one of the schisms as well, is now that sort of influences the politics of today with respect to um, the extent to which um, the uh, indigenous forums and the state courts are able to cooperate because they're still locked into this mentality of we are competing rather than we are actually collaborating to try and give people the best access to justice possible. So, <coughs> yeah. Is there a kind of a subliminal power structure within the indigenous commun communities? Yes. So this is basically the arrangement. <laughs> so um, what you have is, so you have the family which is a very important institution. It's, it's a core institution. Um, and um, typically because these communities are built largely on marriage. Um, so you have like the single family and that has a council which is led by a patriarch that will um, often have some very strong women sort of involved in that. Um, so that single family will be a really important, and this, we're talking extended family, like that's a really important institution. Um, and in the context of a dispute, um, it'll come to that family council most immediately. So the example I use typically with respect to family disputes is, um, uh, let's say um, my husband is, is beating me, um, then I will initially take the issue to my family and say, my husband's beating me, um, can you help intervene or whatever? And they'll be like, okay, well, here's the advice we can give you, et cetera, et cetera. And if that doesn't work, then we go to his family. And so we form the dual family council. So his family and my family will come together um, and um, we'll say, um, we'll hear the matter you know, with both of us together and basically try and resolve it. Um, and if they're not able to, the next primary sort of um, structure is the um, policeman of, um, who's the sort of uh, uh, assistant or deputy of the headman. Um, and the primary institutions are the headman and the chief's level. Um, and so um, you see that most of the disputes will end up going to the headman and his council anyway. Um, but many disputes will go through the headman's policeman, and that's partly to do, again, with the personality politics. If the headman's policeman is actually like a really strong figure and he's respected by that particular community, like that sub-ward, sub-area, um, then they you know, will play a much more active role. But if they're not, then people will typically just kind of circumvent them and go to the headman. Um, but the family council disputes are different from, you know, sort of neighborhood level disputes. So um, uh, if a conflict, for instance, arises between me and, and my neighbor and, you know, my neighbor um, stole my chicken, or at least I suspect that my neighbor stole my chicken and had it for dinner, um, then I might go to my neighbor up first and say, you know, like, why would you do this? But then I would go to um, the, the neighborhood gathering, gather all the neighbors around us and say, will you help us sort of resolve this dispute? Um, because, um, you know, obviously they've offended me. Can you help? So then the neighborhood gathering will try and resolve it. And if that doesn't succeed, you go to the next level, which is the, the ward. And the ward is basically the area that um, coincides with the headman's um, jurisdiction, but um, they can sit on their own as well and resolve the dispute without the headman because once the headman is involved, it becomes a little bit more formalized as, as a, a dispute. Um, and so, um, and then of course, like it can go through the various steps. And so the main sort of institutions are the headman and his council and the chief and his council and the chief's council is made up of the headman in his area. Um, and they will be the sort of ultimate um, appeal structure within that particular village or traditional group tribe um, is the former term that was used. And then you see the, the state institutions sort of at the periphery. Um, and the primary competition, I would say, is between the headmen and the police. Um, but there's also a significant amount of competition between the chiefs and headmen's council um, and the magistrate's court. Um, and in fact, the current legislation that's on the table to try and repeal the 1927 legislation that regulates the space um, is uh, attempting to make the chief and headman's council um, equivalent in standing and um, 
the status of its decision with the magistrate's court, which is a very controversial thing because you know a lot of people feel like, well, maybe the chief's court should be above, but then another, a lot of other people feel that the chief's court actually should be below um, because he's not necessarily complying with state rules. Um, so, and he doesn't have the you know level of training or whatever that the magistrate may have. Um, and the magistrate's court is the entryway into the state system because from there you get the high court and then from the high court you get um, the Supreme Court of Appeal and from the Supreme Court of Appeal you go to the Constitutional Court, which is the ultimate court on all constitutional matters. So um, uh, so there's some other uh, forums, sort of sub-forums, which um, I won't talk much about, but they're um, very interesting in their own right because they deal with like sort of gendered conflict. Um, and so um and Dom be the the one on the left um, basically kind of resolves issues of um, women's uh, virginity or not. <laughs> and so um, you know if a young woman has been accused of not being a virgin, um, then she's the one who basically inspects and you know resolves that conflict. Um, and then um, uh, the one in the bottom right hand system is basically the equivalent of the headman's policeman and the headman but um, specifically dealing with conflicts uh, between men. And so, you know, where men have um, violated the, the male ethical code um, because there is a male ethical code sort of agreed by the men. And so um, if you violate that, then you have to go through this particular system which will discipline you and bring you back into order. So how formal are these institutions? Not in a constitutional sense, but how formally... Right. Uh, are they accepted within the society? Well, they're very they? formal in the sense okay. that people like people like when you ask them, like you know, what do you do in a case like this? People will have a general sense of there's a knowledge this base. This is like what you do. Okay. Yeah, and and if you don't follow the order, people will also be like, oh, you didn't follow the order. You were supposed to have gone there first. But I assume the neighborhood gathering or ward gathering, they are kind of ad hoc. Informal? Yeah, they're okay. quite ad hoc. Yeah, they just kind of get. I mean, it, people know who's going to be there okay. because you know it's so people. The people I mean, around you. I'm trying you. to understand like people call upon that. Okay, we need to have this neighborhood gathering. Or yes. Does that happen ad hoc? Or we have <coughs> yeah. this dispute. Uh, society yeah. should help us, or somebody should come in. Yeah, that's okay. basically what happens. Does everybody yeah. in the neighborhood gathering? Everybody has the right to come. Uh, so, so very good question. <laughs> so, um, again, it's a very patriarchal society, um, and so um, when we talk about everybody, we're actually talking about all of the men, um, and like men above a certain age. Um, so, um, teenage men are not considered men, which young men are considered men. Um, so, you have to be at least like sort of twenty three, twenty five. Um, it's kind of a loose. So when you were saying that women were playing more of a role in the single family and the dual family yeah. relationships, is, is is that in an advisory role or is it an authoritative role? It's it largely in an advisory role. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it's kind of soft power mm -hmm. um, more so than it is like actual formal power. Um, the the main sort of power holder in that um, context is the patriarch. And that's the man yeah. who's the oldest male in the family alive at that time. So in some ways, this is probably a silly question, but I'll ask him anyway. How far has any woman gone in any of the systems? Not very far. That's a good question. Um, so <laughs> they're, they're um, uh, not very far. So um, uh, technically speaking, um, women really don't have any formal roles in this institution, except for that single woman who gathers with some other women to inspect virginity and what have you. Um, but there is another institution that sort of parallels the chief and his council, um, which is an, a construct of legislation. So um, it's, it's, um, it's called the traditional council, and legislation passed in um, 2003 put it in place to say that um, they have to bear responsibility for legislating, um, for basically sort of legislating and administering the community. So they're kind of like the, the ultimate sort of um, decision-making body. Um, uh, the chief is a member of that um, uh, just because he's the chief. Um, but um, that institution has to have a third of its membership be women 
and 40% um, of the people in that institution are appointed by the chief, and then 60% are elected democratically. So that institution has kind of sort of um, shifted the, the dynamics in terms of women's roles quite a bit, because now you have these women who are part of this council, which is recognized as having quite a bit of you know, um, power and, and an important role. Um, but aside from that, um, there aren't any women in this inst in this um, setup. Yeah. So were you actually able to attend any of these things to study it? <laughs> yeah. So I <laughs> I was able to attend because um, women can attend okay. um, to observe, and they can come and attend to um, you know give witness testimony, but um, they can't play sort of formal roles. Okay. Um, but um, I, I must admit that a, a chunk of the data wasn't actually collected by me directly. It was collected by um, local um, high school graduates who um, I trained to collect the data. So they had a little bit more permission, I think, to be there than I would have had at times. Um, and some of them were, were men. And so it was interesting because most of the data around, you know, that men's piece um, comes from the guys. Yeah, because the girls could never go there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I don't even know what the time is. <laughs> um, it's about 1.40, so you have about 10 minutes. Oh, okay, no, I should stop talking. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, I should stop talking. Um, the, the point of this slide is just basically to say that um, one of the things that I grapple with in, in the book project is what does justice actually mean? Um, and so institutionally and in terms of process, you can see, you know, justice can be um, adjudication, which is the sort of highest level of um, uh, uh, institutional like process. Um, and then you have sort of semi-institutional processes like arbitration and mediation and negotiation. And then you have self-help where people maybe avoid, um, you know, the person who um, has wronged them or they just decide to endure what is you know, what they're experiencing, even though that that is actually an offense of their rights. Um, and then, of course, sometimes people can can negotiate on their own behalf. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, it can lead to violence if people feel they have no other options. Um, and the trick is that in Msinga, unfortunately, it often looks like things do end up leading to violence. Um, and so one of the things that I find that the institutions haven't really thought about is the ways in which so they they've done this for you know centuries basically and they think of themselves as you know we are an age-old institution this is what we do we use these methods that are familiar and they work um, but the thing is that the methods that they use are actually very limited um, especially because they ultimately kind of um, merge um, the categories of sort of arbitration or adjudication with mediation and so um, you know, mediation is basically when you're, um, you know, the people opt into the process and you, because they've given you the permission um, to resolve the dispute between them, um, try and help them come to consensus. Um, but then adjudication is different and arbitration is somewhat different. Arbitration, you, you, the people opt in, but they've given you the power to make the decision. It's not <coughs> them having to agree on a, a, an outcome. It's you who gets to make the decision. And adjudication is different still in that like they don't even have to opt in. Um, you just have the power because the institute, like because of the, the your your institution has that power. Um, and so because they merge these different um, ways of resolving disputes, um, you actually find that they often just tell people like this is what you're going to do. But people are um, actually expecting more of a mediation. Um, and in fact, given the social and legal morass. Um, what is needed in the context is more mediation. And so it feels, it seems that like there's just a mismatch in terms of, um, you know, what the goals are and what are the strategies and techniques that are being used. So that's one level um, of problem. And, and so what you find is that even when they're resolving the disputes, um, the disputes won't terminate there. They'll often end up going to an outside forum and that outside forum is very often violence which is obviously not what you want. You want the dispute resolution in that forum to be what ultimately um, concludes and resolves the, the problems. Um, and, um, and a large part of the, the 
the fact of you know what I'm describing in terms of the problems institutionally and the limitations of the powers of the institution actually have to do with the social context. Um, you know, severe poverty and unemployment, high rates of alcohol abuse, <coughs> high rates of interpersonal violence, wide availability of firearms, and geographic isolation so that the police actually don't play a significant role um, and can't really be relied upon to provide the kinds of supports and services that are necessary. And then, of course, systemically, you see how there is these institutions don't have very much in the form of resources, um, and there also isn't very much cooperation between the state institutions and the traditional institutions, um, and there's a lack of clarity as to who has authority in what circumstances, et cetera. So there are all of these sort of systemic and institutional barriers as well as these socioeconomic barriers, which is what leads me to um, making the argument that actually what we're talking about isn't just access to justice, but we're talking about the search for human security. And and recognizing that we need to think about access to justice, especially within these, this context, as one that has a lot to do with um, socioeconomic, um, so social justice, not just sort of justice in the form of institutional access where you can get um, disputes resolved for you. Um, and this quote I like from M Mahmoud Mamdani because in a sense it comes back to the fact that the government's um, choice around preserving these um, boundaries um, from apartheid basically has just, um, you know, sort of entrenched the, the problems of the past. And so actually the state has maybe been deracialized, but it hasn't been democratized. And as a consequence, um, you know, a lot of these um, problems around um, people's security are not able to be resolved. And um, the institutional transformation that's necessary to make that, to, to resolve these problems um, has not actually taken place. So I think that's it. Um, so anyway, the, the conclusion then of my um, uh, uh, findings is basically that what is needed in terms of um, uh, interventions is yes, the, the institutions locally that are resolving these disputes need some sort of input and transformation around how they resolve disputes. And so, you know, skills training and um, tools and resources to make sure that they actually deal with the mediation process better. Um, but actually more importantly in many ways is the fact that you need some real systemic change around the collaborative governance model that um, South Africa has um, adopted or preserved from the apostate era and um, put in place something that actually is gonna be more um, you know, suitable to the circumstances. And that's it. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> Cindy, so when is your book about this coming out? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm hoping next next semester. But next semester. Yeah, but I need to. It has, right? yeah. So I need to kind of finalize my edits. I'm just, yeah, got next another semester. round of edits. Okay. And then, yeah. Definitely hopefully. keep me posted and I'll make sure everybody knows. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is fascinating. Fascin yeah. uh, means it's got, it kind of mirrors in some ways from like my experience in India, where mm -hmm. the Indians have the local governance structure mm -hmm. and how some of this part of the structure is systematized and part of it is not. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is fascinating to look at certain cases which like makes total sense and uh, how Indian government dealt with the tribal population, where mm -hmm. tribal population has much more autonomy and government has kind of a handoff of pr mm -hmm. approach. Uh, and what that does is what you talked about initially, that the indigenous rights that never come into uh, at the top level because the relationship with tribal authorities and the government is just that of resource because uh, most often or not, our tribal lands are resource intensive. They have resources, so it's just a resource relationship. Uh, and then the panchayat throughout institutions, uh, that is pretty much like village councils, is yeah, it kind of mirrors mm -hmm. and the gender roles. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would like to know about, and that again comes from my experience, is that in Indian uh, scenario, there is this, again, a further subliminal power structure based on caste. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the village elders who would be kind of, you know, heading the uh, village council would be doing so historically. Mm. So within one community. So there are sub-communities. 
within one area. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are, if we are talking about a village, then there are five communities, and two communities have been historically been part of that village council. Mm -hmm. So that put three communities at a historical disadvantage. Uh, and correspondingly, there is a political leverage as well. So that connects with the democratic structure. So is there anything like that which mm -hmm. is happening uh, in the indigenous communities that you're talking about? So there isn't a caste system, um, but it's definitely true that some are more equal than others. Yeah, that, yes. Yeah, and and that has huge political implications because um, so one of the things in South Africa right now is the fact that we're one of the most mineral rich countries in the world, and um, in fact we have the largest um, supplies of platinum. Yeah. Um, and ironically enough, of course, um, those platinum mines have largely been discovered in these rural areas. And so you can Gosh, imagine, right? <laughs> I mean, you can imagine what goes on there because people are trying to claim back their land. There are these traditional authorities, some of whom actually weren't even legitimate under, you know, pre-colonial arrangements, but actually were put in place by the apartheid government because these were leaders who would cooperate with it. Um, and so you have all of these, like, people who are vying for position and vying for political power. And you know, once you have economic power, it's not that difficult to, to parlay that into um, political power, especially in this you know, country um, that has less developed um, uh, political institutions or democratic institutions and safeguards. Um, and so that is definitely a factor in South Africa. And so what you're seeing actually is that a lot of ordinary rural people are getting left out of these, um, you know, sort of elite partnerships and um, arrangements. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people are getting removed just because it's like, well, we, you know, um, Anglo-American has discovered such and such mineral on your land and your traditional leader has signed. So you now have to move, right? And so you're seeing a lot of people get sort of redispossessed mm -hmm. because of the fact of these political and economic sort of partnerships and arrangements. And the one thing I wanted to pick up on, um, which you mentioned earlier, is the fact that actually, you know, there is also political and economic motive behind the government's decision to be hands off about these areas, right? Um, it's the fact that they're like, firstly, it's too expensive to invest in all of the rural areas, especially these like far off remote rural areas. You know, if people want services, they should come to the cities. Right. And so we're just not even really going to bother with them. But apart from that, there's also the idea that, well, we have all of these institutions already there. So why don't we just leave them to take care of these sort of marginal outcasts? Right. And like um, we'll take care of all of those people who are like, you know, in the areas that um, like actually have power and and means. Um, and so that's another piece of why I like Mamdani's um, you know, claim because he's, he makes this claim about citizen versus subject. And he says, you know, the people in the urban areas are the citizens and the people in the rural areas are the subjects, right? Subject to these um, sort of traditional institutions to whom government just kind of um, sells off the responsibility for providing them with services or any kinds of protection. I think it's very, the concept is kind of a very lazy idea of regional autonomy mm -hmm. uh, that we are just like uh, granting you regional autonomy without uh, actual powers. And mm. then we can put it out that, okay, these regions, these tribal lands, or whatever we are talking about are autonomous in some sense. They have legislative hold on uh, their population, but in actuality that doesn't lead to the amount of social good that you may want. No, it's true. I think the difficulty though in South Africa is that these institutions do actually have real power. Okay. They have a lot of power to suppress and they have a lot of power to oppress um, the people who are their so-called subjects. Um, and so part of the argument, um, you know, in the work that I've been doing is around citizenship rights and the fact that, you know, unlike in the U.S. where the claim of rural and um, uh, indigenous communities has been for autonomy where it's like, okay, we're going to maintain our reservation, we want to protect our lands and we want to you know, sort of um, govern ourselves here. In South Africa, the claim has been very different. It's been, we want our land, we want to be able to govern ourselves here, but we don't want to be insulated from the government at large. We fought for the right to be South Africans. And so we want to have, you know, full citizenship rights, full access as South Africans. And so the fact that these 
um, institutions have as much control as they do, especially the chiefs, not so much the headmen. The headmen don't have very much power at all, but the chiefs have a lot of power and they're able to control people's lives, you know, who don't have any other like protection, basically. Are there term limits for chiefs? No, they don't they have, know. yeah, you just kind of, in fact, um, the two chiefs in the area that I have been working in, um, both of them just died within the last um, five years. In fact, one la died last year and he was 95. So, so would it be family lines? That yeah. The so, yeah. 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 So there is al already a power st structure established by that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does, do you see any change given the discovery of, of wealth in the very rural areas that, that there's more power, there's more influence that those folks might have just because of the economy? Well, there is more power and influence. The only unfortunate thing is that it's concentrated at the very top level. So, um, you know, ordinary people um, who are living in those areas don't actually, it, there isn't much trickle down. Um, and so, um, and, and again, it's, it's because it's so much personality politics involved, right? The system is largely built on personality um, sort of politics. And so um, these traditional leaders, whether their people will benefit or not, is contingent upon how good the traditional leader is, right? And how ethically he's going to conduct himself in recognizing that his responsibility is to his people rather than just to lining his own pockets. Um, Can they ever, ever rule... Can they move a chief out if they feel like the chief is not being representative? Or in the old days, they could. So pre-colonially, they could. But their power to be able to um, oust a chief was really um, based in the fact that they could um, uh, basically <coughs> like deny him, um, you know, support in terms of if the tribe was going to go to war, they would say, we're not going to support you. Um, they could leave, right, and, and be like, we're taking the land, we're actually seceding. Um, uh, but now they actually, oh, and the last thing, a really important piece is the fact that actually the chief was accountable to them. So for his position, he had to answer to the people. But the apartheid government flipped that so that traditional leaders, in order to have office, are accountable to the government. Mm -hmm. And so now traditional leaders get their certificate of you know, legitimacy from the government, not from the people that they are supposedly, you know, responsible for. So those people have very little power to say, we don't want this chief. Um, and if they do actually try to do that, you know, the chief already has so much power and like relational ties and political ties with like, you know, the politicians who ultimately have to approve that, that chances are very slim that, you know, the ruling party is going to be like, yeah, we're taking this guy out, even though we have all of these, like, you know, mining deals with him, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very sort of tricky situation. Excuse me. No, that's fine. Thank yeah. you so much for coming. Yeah, it was very, very much, Cindy. Yeah. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and feel free to just um, throw me a question afterwards as well. Like, Feel free to let me know if you want to know anything more so, in a yeah. different context. <laughs> How the democratic participation are we looking at? These are these people integrated in, uh, democratically? Yeah. Um, like, how much democratic participation? Yeah. Oh, that's another really significant thing is the fact that the African National Congress, the ruling party, believes that the traditional leaders bring the rural vote. So exactly. they believe that, and actually their support is declining in urban areas. So the bulk of their support is coming from rural votes, and they believe that it's traditional leaders who bring them the rural vote. And is that the so, case? Uh, does you know, there, there's there's some studies that doubt, like call that into question, um, really shed doubt on that. But um, there hasn't been anything like really systematic and comprehensive, so we don't. <coughs> so maybe that's what we need to study, right? <laughs> like, Let's wait for the next you know, is it no. true that they bring the rural vote? Because it might be such a game changer. Thank you so much, Bill.